This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is prairie dogs. It's another in my series on keystone species and I have two experts who will be talking about them. The subject is prairie dogs. We're talking about keystone species and I have two guests that will be talking about them. I have Taylor Jones and Bill Van Pelt. I usually like to give my guests a few minutes to talk about who they are. So let me start with you, Bill, if you could give a little bit of background about yourself. Uh, and any opening remarks you have about uh, pra uh, I'm sorry, prairie dogs and uh, their being threatened, that sort of thing. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is Bill Van Pelt, and I'm the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, Grassland Coordinator. Uh, my role uh, with uh, the gra as being Grassland Coordinator is to uh, work with the variety of uh, species of wildlife that are found on the grasslands. Those species include uh, the prairie dog species, primarily in on the grasslands. Uh, what we're talking about is black-tailed prairie dogs. Um, there are a four prairie dog species found in the United States. The, the others are, are found in, in grasslands, but more associated, associated with the Great Basin. I have um, been in this role uh, since uh, 2008. Prior to the, uh, this role, I was the uh, state mammalogist for uh, Arizona with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And in that role, I worked with uh, reintroducing uh, the Mexican gray wolf, uh, California condor, the black-footed ferret, and the black-tailed prairie dog here in Arizona. Uh, I'm actually housed, still housed with the Arizona Game and Fish as my role as the grassland coordinator with the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. I've been uh, doing this for about uh, 32 years now and enjoy working with a variety of, of non-game species. When I saw your uh, organization, WAFWA, I was reminded of uh, FDR's old uh, alphabet soup organizations. I think it's the longest acronym of anyone I've ever interviewed. Uh, uh, Taylor, if you could give a little bit of background about who you are and uh, anything you want to say about uh, prairie dogs. Sure. So I, um, I studied Andean bears in graduate school, and then I went on to, once I got my... Um, degree in wildlife um, conservation. I went on to work for many years on Endangered Species Act protections for endangered species um, with an organization called Wild Earth Guardians. Um, I've been working for a couple years as a prairie dog relocator in Boulder County. And I have just recently become the coordinator of the Prairie Dog Coalition. And the mission of the Prairie Dog Coalition is to empower organizations and individuals with conservation tools that protect prairie dogs and restore their ecosystems. And um, our main focus is reducing human wildlife conflict. So we aim to provide toolkits to people throughout the prairie dog range for preventing and uh, reducing conflict between uh, prairie dogs and humans. And I will just say that um, having worked as a relocator and been up close and personal with these guys, I really appreciate their tenacity and their personalities. And I think they're fascinating creatures. Well, we'll get into a little bit about that in a moment. I just wanted to ask, when uh, you speak about uh, conflict, uh, you know, you could think of, okay, wolves would certainly have conflict, but prairie dogs seem rather innocuous little uh, fellows. But do they do damage to, to land or do they do damage to property? Uh, that is that what, where the conflict comes in? So they often come into conflict with agricultural and land uses. Prairie dogs and people like to settle down in the same sorts of areas. Um, so they'll come into conflict with development. Um, they they aren't really compatible with um, irrigated agricultural land uses. There's a strong perception that they're not compatible with ranching um, or livestock grazing. There's mixed evidence 
uh, and not a lot of science about whether or not that's um, whether or not that's actually true. And Bill, feel free to jump in with further information. I think you might have more experience with this than I do. But um, definitely, there's a lot of perceived conflict. And any animal that burrows and digs holes in the ground is occasionally hard for humans to live with. And that's certainly um, something that we uh, take seriously at Prairie Dog Coalition. And that's why our focus is, is uh, reducing that conflict and giving people the tools they need to live alongside uh, this species. Bill, do you have a comment on the conflict between humans and prairie dogs? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with Taylor there. There's a lot of real and perceived conflict. Um, that urban interface with uh, prairie dogs and the expansion of urban areas, you know, definitely can cause conflict. You know, folks often don't like uh, prairie dogs in their front yard, uh, golf courses, um, graveyards. And, you know, so that human interface uh, especially in the urban settings is, is definitely something that has to be managed and, and uh, you know we have worked with the Prairie Dog Coalition in, in that and other organizations you know, here in Arizona we have Habitat Harmony which is an organization found in northern Arizona that uh, often assists us with trying to reduce that uh, uh, conflict associated uh, with, with prairie dogs so I know when I did a show on beavers as a keystone species, you know, beaver pelts were highly valued. Uh, were prairie dog pelts ever highly valued, or is it just the conflict that, as described by you two uh, that has been the main issue? Um, I would say it was uh, the, the perceived conflict uh, between prairie dogs and the ranching industry. Uh, earlier in my career, you know, I did some research uh, there at the National Archives, and you know, this this uh, campaign, I guess you could say, uh, with prairie dogs and such, started back as far as uh, World War One, and um, you know, the the propaganda that was developed uh, had was associated with um, the. I guess the realization that folks were looking at and seeing how prairie dogs eat grass and, you know, we're trying to grow cattle to feed our boys at war. And so a lot of the um, big poisoning campaigns and the big um, efforts to eradicate prairie dogs or de dra drastically, re you know, reduce their numbers really started in the, the early 1900s. And so, um, you know, some of those studies, you know, I, I don't think would pass muster this day and age. I mean, they do reduce forage, but we also know with recent studies and that, that by keeping the grass clipped, it's at a higher nutritional value. So the weight gains for cattle uh, isn't that much different uh, on prairie dog towns versus off prairie dog towns. Um, there is some real recent work that's being done uh, there in Colorado that indicates that during drought conditions, though, there is direct conflict uh, or competition, not conflict, competition between prairie dogs and, and cattle and weight gain. And so, and, you know, if you think about it intuitively, that does make sense because in a drought condition, you, you don't get the growing situation with the grass so they're not putting up the nutrients as much and so you know that higher protein content grass you know isn't there for the cows to gain weight so intuitively that makes sense um you know and historically if you think about it, the bison who were large grazers on the the grasslands you know when those conditions occurred they migrated and in in our situations today you know, uh, we don't have that ability for uh, the animals to move across large landscapes. And so other management uh, situations have to occur. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of animals uh, prairie dogs are, because they are of the squirrel family, correct? 
So we yeah. think of squirrels, of course, you know, going around in the trees like chipmunks and, and whatnot, bur burrowing uh, their little uh, acorns or whatnot. Prairie dogs, how far back did they separate from what, what we consider, you know, squirrels? And did, were they, did they come to the grasslands or were the grasslands different back a million or two years, years ago when they split off and they just stayed as the, you know, the scenery changed? Uh, what, what's their story, uh, Taylor? Um, so the evolutionary history of prairie dogs, I think that's something Bill could probably speak to a little bit more than I can. Okay. Sorry to uh, no put you on the spot. But... Oh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, no, uh, you know, um, uh, I don't remember all the, 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 Pleistocene and all that sort of era, but you know that there were um, uh, prairie dogs on the as the grass as the seas and stuff receded, and as the um, large grace glaciers started to recede, you know there were there were vast grasslands here in North America, and you had that you know the prehistoric bison, you had the prehistoric sloths uh, and horses and such running on these grasslands. There was a, a prairie dog um, uh, lineage, actually, that developed. And so the, these species have developed and adapted to the boom bust cycles of the grasslands over time. You know, and like the ancient bison and so forth, you know, uh, over evolutionary change, you know, that you come to the, the uh, current distribution of, of prairie dogs you know there are two families of prairie dogs you got the white tailed species which includes white tailed gunnisons in utah and then you have the black tailed prairie dog species or family uh, genus which includes the black tailed prairie dog but then there's uh, what is known as the mexican prairie dog down in mexico <clears throat> And so you can see how far evolutionary wise and, and occurrence wise, how far south the, uh, uh, the prairie dogs have occurred. And here in the United States, we have the four uh, prairie dog species. Um, uh, the Mexican prairie dog species is, is endemic to Mexico or only occurs in Mexico. Um, and so, you know, not only did you have a historical uh, prairie dog uh, occurrence, you know, on the grasslands, but then you had that evolutionary split from white tail to black tail, and you know the the question would be, well, what's the difference? Well, a lot of the white tail species are more in the Great Basin type grasslands, higher elevation, and the black tail prairie dogs are there in the lower elevations, um, and uh, more associated with what we would call the Great Plains um, here in the United States and going down into to Mexico and such. So prairie dogs, would they be considered a eusocial species? I'm not familiar with that term, eusocial. EU, you know, uh, that like uh, some insects like, uh, you know, uh, uh, bees and ants and termites are considered eusocial and that they, they formed, you know, I guess you might call them primitive civilizations or, or cultures there. It seems that with the prairie dog towns, that would seem to be very similar. Oh, uh, yes, very much so. Uh, and, and I know Taylor probably has a lot more on this than what I do, but I mean, they do form family units within their uh, towns. They're called coteries. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been some work done here in Arizona with the Gunnison's prairie dog on language and, and such, but you know, Taylor could probably expand more on this than than, than I can. <laughs> Go ahead, Taylor. Sure. I I I love to talk about this aspect of prairie dogs. They are I don't know that you would consider them necessarily use social in the in the pure sense of that word. Um but they are colonial and they definitely rely on each other for survival. They since they tend to remain in the same area for uh, for generations. A lot of prairie dog burrows are occupied for generations and they're matrilineal. So the female prairie dogs, um, the, the, the coteries usually consist of uh, 
females and their daughters and then the male prairie dogs will usually disperse out of their natal burrow um, after about a year or so. And so that way they avoid uh, inbreeding. So you have this sort of matrilineal society that is uh, strongly structured around family groups and is also strongly structured around the colonial um, work of watching out for predators. Because prairie dogs, since they don't really migrate and they don't, um, and they stay in the same place for most of their lives, uh, predators know where to find them, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of animals coming to prairie dog towns to get lunch and dinner. And what the prairie dogs do to combat this is they post lookouts and they keep an eye out and they'll mention their communication, their, their alarm calls, the little chirps that you hear out on prairie dog towns. Um, a, a researcher named Khan Slobotchikov has done a lot of research on those alarm calls using um, sonograms and breaking those calls down into their component parts. Yeah. And they're very complex. There's a lot more information encoded in those calls than a human ear can really pick up on, but prairie dogs can. And what they're saying is um, a lot of detailed information about what they see, what is approaching the colony. They can distinguish colors. They can sometimes, we, we think they can even tell individual humans apart. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, what we might deem words for various types of predators. So it's one of the more complex animal languages that humans have managed to decode at all. Mm -hmm. Not to say there's not other complex animal languages out there, but this is one that we can actually decode a little bit because we have correspondence between what the alarm call sounds like and what's happening out on the prey dog colony. So um, Dr. Slobotchikov has been able to do a lot of basically decoding of prey dog language. And they have a lot of other communication, um, but they, they, so they chatter to each other in their burrows quite a bit, but trying to understand that, it's sort of like if you just dropped someone into a coffee shop uh, and there were no external cues as to what people were talking about. So we don't know um, if they're saying anything or if they are what they're saying. Well, given the small size, it's interesting because, you know, I did a show on elephants too. And, you know, elephants, of course, have huge brains. Uh, uh, the great apes have large brains. Uh, whales obviously have large brains. Um, but then you think of some of the other smart animals like psittacids or the corvids amongst birds. Uh, how does such a small, you know, I mean, this is a creature that's a, just a little bit bigger than your average squirrel with a, you know, an appropriate sized head. How does a small brain like that have arguably one of the more complex languages outside of humans? I have read some interesting stuff about brain body relationships that indicates that it's not the pure size mm. of the brain it's the proportion of brain to body size that really determines um, I guess level of intelligence you would call, you could call it so corvids have um, almost the same proportion of brain to body size as humans do and you know they're widely acknowledged as incredibly intelligent birds. And so are like parrots and, um, and I think prairie dogs would fall into the same category that their brain to body size ratio is probably relatively high. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, that this is being studied. I saw uh, a YouTube uh, video maybe a month or so ago, two months maybe, uh, where they were using artificial intelligence to t try to decode some of the languages of killer whales and some of the other whale species. Has anything ever been done with that that you know of with prairie dogs? Because I'm saying if they're in conflict with us, would there be a way that possibly, you know, a few decades from now, when once AI, 
understands their language. And we could say, listen, we'll give you this piece of land over here if you, you leave this one alone. To, I mean, is that even a possibility or is that just sci-fi fantasy? I would love to think that would be possible, uh-huh. but it, I know very little about AI and I don't know that it's capable of such things. And I don't know that even if we could communicate complex concepts like land transfer to prairie dogs that they would understand. <laughs> um, they're smart, but I don't know if they're that smart. I would, I would love to be able to explain simple things to prairie dogs. Mm-hmm. I've definitely um, had them in cages when I was relocating them and felt terrible because they looked at me accusingly. And I was like, listen, I would love to be able to tell you that I'm taking you to a safe place and we're not going to hurt you or eat you. And um, so that, I think, might be more um, potentially possible if we're talking like cool science fiction concepts of, of communicating with other species than um, voluntarily explaining to prairie dogs that they need to move their colony next door. Um, like I said, I would love to think that was possible and that would make all of our lives a lot easier. But um, yeah, I, 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 I sincerely doubt that we would be able to do that, yeah. cool though it would be. So Bill, uh, let, let's talk a bit about uh, uh, the day-to-day life of a prairie dog. One, are they herbivores or omnivores or carnivores? Uh, two, what are their greatest non-human threats? Is it, is it mustelids like badgers that dig underground or wolverines or, or whatnot? Um, or is it birds that come and pick them off or, or coyotes? Or... <laughs> well, boy, you named all of them, um, <laughs> except for wolverines. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, prairie dogs are primarily herbivores. Um, uh, they they will on occasion you know eat an insect here or there but they're primarily herbivores um, so they eat the grasses um, forbs and such that grow in and around the prairie dog towns um, and yeah basically you know their their primary uh, threats to them as prairie dogs are a variety of uh, predators you know um, you have that migrating raptors such as golden eagles, fruchinous hawks, um, red-tailed hawks. Um, then you, you know, have, you know, then the, uh, the specialists such as the black-footed ferret, which, you know, was and is still considered one of the most endangered mammals in, in the world that prey upon prairie dogs. Um, and, uh, you know, but coyotes uh, often team up with badgers. And, you know, as the badger is digging out the prairie dog, you know, it'll run out in a different location and the coyote will run it down and, and, and take it for a meal. Uh, so, you know, but then yet on the same side, you know, we talk about prairie dogs being a keystone species. Uh, how you have to kind of look at that is looking across a, a grassland and, you know, grasses grow to certain heights and such. And what prairie dogs do, uh, is to what they do is they clip the the vegetation not only to feed but also as, as Taylor had mentioned you know to ensure the line of sight so the sentinels can give warning on these predators that I was just talking about and so I know when we were doing the reintroductions here in Arizona you know we noticed that um, not only were they clipping the grasses and such to maintain that line of sight, but they are also uh, clipping you know, new growth from trees and such as well uh, to ensure that they have that visibility. But, you know, with this shortened grass area in this sea of grass, you know, think of them kind of as islands. And so what they are doing is they're in engineering their area or conditions that are uh, beneficial to themselves and thus some of these other obligates such as um, long-billed curlews, mountain plovers, uh, take advantage of this uh, condition that they create for nesting, for example. You know, again, because of the visibility and such, these bird species um, uh, use prairie dog 
uh, colonies. Um, Burning Owls is another great example. Uh, in, in Arizona, prairie dogs, black tail prairie dogs were extirpated, which meant we were able to eliminate them from the state of Arizona. 2008, we started reintroducing black tail prairie dogs back to the grasslands of uh, southeastern Arizona. And within one year, we had burrowing owls that have locate, located these towns. And by the second year, they're already nesting in those towns. So that, that strong connection that these grassland species have to these, these uh, habitat conditions that uh, prairie dog creates, I mean, you can look at a lot of these species and the downward projections of different population levels are directly associated with the downward direction of what prairie dogs um, uh, from the historical numbers have, have gone as well. Um, most animals that are, live in packs or in, in tribes or, or colonies as uh, the prairie dogs do often have intraspecies conflicts. Uh, are there ever wars between colonies? Uh, are, are there are there more aggressive types of colonies or more? I mean, you mentioned several different species. Um, uh, one of the prairie dog species more, uh, you know, aggressive within, or maybe you know, do, do the black-tailed uh, ones route white-tailed ones when they come across them? Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Taylor. Oh, I know that prairie dog um, coteries are very territorial, so they will defend small territories within the colony. And so that conflict is, um, is quite common. But in terms of between colonies, I don't know of that ever occurring. I believe their habitat preferences are different enough that they don't overlap too much. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with Taylor. I, I, I am unaware of colony to colony strife. I mean, in part, if you think about it again, biology wise, you know, uh, the males, they leave the areas uh, of their natal, you know, their birth to go to other colonies and find potential mates and such. So now the males you know, in defending their territories and even having new an animals come into their colonies definitely fight. I mean, you know, I'm sure Taylor's seen this as well. Um, you know, we've had males with tails bitten off, you know, ears gone, you know, so, in, in, uh, you know, there's been a couple of records of males, you know, killing each other uh, with, with introductions into colonies. But as far as, you know, a whole out colony against colony, I, I have not heard of that before. Mm -hmm. Although, if, again, looking at the historical literature, um, Claudia Oaks out of Texas did her master's thesis, and her and I actually had, you know, kind of separate work but dual work about the National Archives, but she did find occurrences in the National Archives where um, cowboys described going across the grasslands and finding 200 prairie dogs walking, you know, going someplace, not sure where, but it, it's almost as though the entire town decided, well, you know what, we're going to relocate, and they just take off. Mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, there is some evidence, I guess you could say, in the historical accounts that talk about large relocations, I guess you could say, self-relocations of, of, of animals. But as far as uh, taking over another coterie and stuff, I, I, I have not heard that. All right, That's let's... fascinating. I did not know that. I mean, I would imagine that we are not seeing some of the behavior that used to occur simply because prey dog range has become so fragmented and so reduced from its historical extent. And so we, we simply don't know what, what, they, what the behavior of these, I mean, they were massive colonies. Um, I, I don't even know how big they were, but. Are we talking I, thousands of individuals? Oh yeah. Oh, those, we're those talking, things, talking millions. millions. <laughs> 
Yeah, those same historical documents talk about prairie dogs out as far as the eye can see. I mm -hmm. mean, these were thousands of acres. Well, there was, there was a town in uh, the Panhandle of Texas that they estimated was 110 miles long by approximately 40 miles wide. Wow. And so you're talking, you know, again, these grasslands are, are you know, historical grasslands were extensive. And, you know, these prairie dogs, you know, occupied, you know, those habitats that were suitable for them. You know, we talk about the historical occurrence of grasslands in the United States, up in Canada and Mexico, saying 500 million acres. Well, not all that was, um, could be occupied by prairie dogs. You know, there's different soil types, the sandier soil types, prairie dogs can't build their burrows in. So, you know, I think if you look at historical occurrence and available grasslands, uh, you're talking about, you know, they probably occupied anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the of the grasslands due to, you know, things that were beyond their control, like, you know, like I mentioned, soil types, uh, different grassland, grassland heights, you know, um, grasslands, if you think about it, it's, it's kind of like a mini forest, okay? You have short grass, mid grass, and tall grass. And prairie dogs, and when we talk about prairie dogs, we're primarily talking about the black-tailed prairie dogs. So I want to emphasize that. They occur pretty good in short grass. But it, when you start getting into the mixed grass or mid-grass species, they need to have a relationship with grazers. And that's where the bison came in to allow them to expand and contract the prairie dogs were able to expand and contract based upon, you know, the grazing pressure that was put on by bison. But as I mentioned to you, once the resource was gone, the bison would leave. And so then those, those, those populations would retract historically. And then you talk about tall grasses. I mean, and that's, you know, eastern Iowa, you know, uh, eastern Kansas into Illinois. We don't have any indication that prairie dogs even actually occurred over in those areas. So uh, that's why when we talk about grasslands, you really have to talk about what you're talking about, short grass versus mid grass versus tall grass, and, and, and keep it in perspective when it comes to, oh, well, what was the historical occurrence? You know, because you throw out that 500 million acres and you look at what the current estimate for Occupied acreage for black-tailed prairie dogs were at about 2.2 million, and um, you know, and put that against you know the uh, 500 million, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, we don't have any prairie dogs. So let us talk a little bit about uh, the role of prairie dogs as a keystone species. First of all, uh, I've talked to several people over different animals. How do each of you define what a keystone species is, uh, Taylor? I would say keystone species is a species that has a disproportionate impact relative to the amount, to the number of animals on the environment. So you can talk about like umbrella species, keystone species, and um, ecosystem engineers. I would say that prairie dogs fall into both the ecosystem engineer and the keystone species role because when you have prairie dogs in an area, it really changes the character of that area. So that's the disproportionate impact. Without prairie dogs, you have a very different environment than you do with prairie dogs. So they really change, they change the game. And diversity is always a good thing, and that's what prairie dogs do. They create, like Bill was saying, patches of short grass, very trimmed, uh, highly nutritious grass and then at the outer edges of the colony it sort of um, gets taller and then fades into the taller grass outside of the colony so you have these, this variety of grass heights that provides habitat for a really wide variety of species a bill and they're all oh, go ahead I'm sorry ahead. I thought you were done I thought you were done go ahead um, they also allow for a lot of processes like water infiltration deeper mm -hmm. into the ground. Um, 
they turn the soil, they create uh, a lot of habitat for a wide variety of species from invertebrates to amphibians to the birds that we talked about already, and they're a great food source. So through all of those processes, they create really complex and diverse ecosystems. Would you agree with that definition, Bill? Yeah, yeah, I mean, prairie dogs, you know, you take away prairie dogs and they, the, the, eco, the ecosystem changes, okay? Um, again, I'm real familiar with what my work has been here in Arizona, and you have uh, a lot of tree invasion associated with it then. Um, and, you know, you don't really think about, um, you know, all these small animals being able to, to create you know, a habitat type, but then you remove them and after 70, 80 years, you see how the landscape has changed. So I, I think Taylor is spot on with the description of a, a engineer keystone species. It, it's a species that has the ability to change the surrounding ecosystem and it has the ability to change parts of it, but not the entire, you know, because even with, with beaver, you know, for example, which was one of the species you mentioned, you know, they change stream flow, uh, plant composition, et cetera. But overall, you still have a riparian uh, a system. And there are there's a segment of that riparian that, that is different now. And that's how I envision prairie dog towns. You have this sea of grassland, but yet here you have these islands in there that, are, are uh, different, you know, that we talked about the nutritional value changing with the grasses. Well, as, as Taylor mentioned, part of that is because of the, uh, the prairie dogs burrowing and bringing different nutrients closer to the surface that, you know, these plants are able to take advantage of that, you know, uh, if it wasn't there, you know, they won't, they wouldn't have been able to do that. So I, yeah, I think Taylor was spot on with the definition. Would it be fair to say that uh, prairie dogs are to grasslands as beavers are to wetlands? I say black-tailed prairie dogs are to short grass prairies <laughs> as beavers are to wetlands, yes. <laughs> okay. uh, you wanted to say something with that, like Taylor? Go. Yeah, I would mention too that um, Woody shrub encroachment is one of the bigger threats to grassland ecosystems. Absolutely. And prairie dogs help prevent that. So you're talking about... And how do they do, do that? How do they do that? What? How do they do that? Uh, they clip the okay. uh, shrubs as they are growing. Okay. So usually if you are able to establish prairie dogs on a section of prairie that has been um, invaded by various types of invasive species, if you can establish them either by doing a controlled burn and then uh, reintroducing them or otherwise um, clearing out the vegetation so that they can establish a colony, oh. they tend to create um, an environment that is favorable to native plants and unfavorable to woody shrubs and invasive species. So they actually help with restoration work if you can get them established. So uh, one of the odder things that uh, in looking up uh, information here is uh, prairie dogs were ravaged a century or more ago by the bubonic plague and it still is uh, rampant. How does a, a human disease, tr well, I guess maybe because they're rats or they're rodents, uh, what is, how did that occur? and? How have they been coping with that, uh, aside from other predators and humans? Yeah, so um, the disease, bubonic plague, um, is, uh, I mean, there's, there's really good records of it. Uh, how it was introduced into the United States was in San Francisco. Uh, it came over on uh, ships, uh, the rats on the ships. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting um, because that was approximately about 1905. And then, uh, you know, we recorded uh, plague 
within the prairie, Gunnison's Prairie Dog in about 1932 in the Four Corners area. And, you know, plague is, is it, what carries it is actually the flea and, and various flea species. And so uh, it, it can have a very devastating impact on, you know, colonial animals uh, such as, as prairie dogs um, because the fleas can transfer to the, you know, at, across the town essentially. Um, but it can have the same impact on ground squirrels uh, etc. Uh, so uh, it is an exotic disease, and you know, uh, over time, you know, what you see is is it moving because of changing conditions that allows the fleas then to move. It allows them to then you know go further and further east. They they used to say the hundredth meridian, you know, that it was like an invisible. Bar- barrier because they said that the climatic conditions or the conditions weren't favorable for it and we saw there in 2008 that you know that barrier or 2005 2008 you know that barrier wasn't really a true barrier because we did see and observe some large die-offs of uh, black-tailed prairie dogs there in south dakota and such but yeah it was it's, it's really well documented uh uh, being introduced in 1905, San Francisco, getting to the prairie dogs in about 1932, and in other wildlife species. So Taylor, uh, let me uh, let's talk about the future then uh, of prairie dogs, uh, as well as uh, uh, human expansion into their areas. Um, what what are some of the programs, or what are some of the protocols that that you wish could be enacted by the government or the state governments, um, and do does the health and, and the 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 prosperousness of prairie dogs uh, does that play a role in any way in global warming and combating that? Let me let me start with um, state statutes. Um, one of the difficult things about uh, knowing how many prairie dogs are out there and what is happening on the ground. Um, there's not a lot of tracking of how many prairie dogs are poisoned. Um, and poisoning is a very common way of, of getting rid of prairie dog colonies. So I would love for there to be a little bit more of a concerted effort to track uh, numbers of colonies that are poisoned and how many prairie dogs um, are are removed every year. Um, Bill, I don't know if you know of anything like that that's actually going on, or if that's something that WAFWA tracks. Yeah, no, you know that's that's really kind of a difficult thing to do, and because in part, you know, like many many things, <laughs> uh, prairie dogs are classified differently in different states and by different organizations or agencies. So, for example, prairie dogs and black-tailed prairie dogs in particular in the Midwest, a lot of the classification, they have dual classifications uh, where the wildlife agency sees them as a non-game species or species need of management or species of greatest conservation need. The agricultural side of things deems them as pests. And so you have conflicting regulations associated with the same animal. And so, you know, as far as tracking, how, you know, how many prairie dogs are um, poisoned and so forth, you know, I, I really think what real one of the things I'd like to see done is is really alignment of the uh, regulations across different agencies with management authorities um, that allows for. Uh, you know, conservation of the species as well as management of the species as well. You know, so for example, in Arizona, you know, we worked with the Department of Ag on the classification of different poisons. And so those uh, are toxicants. Um, uh, and, you know, those aren't allowed in the area where we're trying to reintroduce black tailed prairie dogs. In Arizona, also, we modified our shooting regulations that don't allow for the shooting of prairie dogs where we're doing the reintroductions. So I think, 
you know, in, in a lot of ways, because of all these different silos, um, there is inconsistencies that you see across the states with how management occurs, and it would be great to see if we can uh, get those agencies talking and the realignment of the regulations. Yeah, a more holistic, um, big picture approach to prairie dog conservation would be huge. And I think too, one of, you were mentioning conflicting regulations, and that made me think of black uh, black footed ferrets, which are listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act as endangered, which is the highest level of protection. Um, there, people are working really hard to reintroduce black footed ferrets to areas across their range, but the hardest part about doing that is that there's not enough of a prey base for them. They rely almost entirely on prairie dogs. And there's incentives out there for reintroducing black-footed ferrets, but there's not, as far as I know, a lot of incentives for conserving prairie dogs. Mm -hmm. And so those two things are sort of in conflict. We're spending a lot of money on breeding and reintroducing black-footed ferrets, but we're also spending a lot of money on controlling and poisoning curry dogs. Well, wouldn't so, would it be wouldn't it be uh, to to present it to ranchers and people to say it's in their economic interest if you can't get them any other way? Uh, if prairie dogs go away, the ground is less aerated, the ground is less able to support crops or to support cattle or, or whatever animal. Um, how, how, how do you turn that narrative into something those people can understand and get behind? I, I, I think, you know, where the successes are and have been, especially in eastern Colorado, uh, as Taylor mentioned, you know, there is an incentive-based approach for reintroducing black-footed ferrets. And those incentives are actually associated with maintaining or allowing uh, prairie dogs to occur on their landscape. But, you know, uh, when, you know, and those are incentives, but, you know, when you're talking about income and such, you know, those incentives typically are not at the level to replace the income from, from ranching. You know, it, 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 it offsets it, but, you know, it doesn't completely uh, uh, replace it. And so you have to, you know, work with the rancher and see what their operations are to come up with a program that allows for uh, them to be able to maintain their uh, livelihood on the landscape and also allows for conservation. And, and I think we're making progress in that, in that area, but you know, it's not a one size fits all, you know. I, I recently, we just had a grappling conference up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Taylor was there as well as myself. And I was amazed at the, the amount of grass um, and the size of the ranches up there versus in, you know, Arizona. You know, most of our ranches down here, you know, it's not uncommon to be working with a landowner who has 100,000 acres. And that 100,000 acres is the same size as a rancher in Wyoming can do on 2,000 acres because of the productivity and everything. So when it comes to incentives, the reason I mention it is when it comes to incentives, it, it's really based upon the area and and the situation of, of the, the uh, ranching and, and the operation, you know, because when you have stalkers versus cow-calf operations, you know, your grazing regimes are different, so you got to take that into consideration. And, you know, I, I think we're making progress in it, but, you know, it's, it's not as simplistic as, hey, you know, we'll pay you, you know, 50 bucks an acre uh, to allow prairie dogs. Um, because you have to look at the entire operation to see what that replaces as far as an income and livelihood. So as, as let's just wrap up then. Um, as you look ahead towards the middle and the end of the century, Bill, are you... Uh, positive or negative about the future of prairie dogs uh, and what is like one one thing that if you could change you'd think would be the, the biggest boon to uh, saving prairie dogs you know I, there's been some recent work that I've been involved with with looking at what is the available habitat on the landscape and you know you're looking at 20 to 22 million acres of 
potential habitat that's still on the landscape. And, you know, I truly believe that if you can have targeted conservation efforts, uh, primarily focused on invasive species, uh, such as the, as Taylor mentioned, the encroachment from woody vegetation, you can have a very solid positive effect on prairie dogs and other grassland species uh, here in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Um, even with facing climate change, you know, the, the work that we uh, looked at, looked at climate change and model different scenarios to allow us to, to look at focusing or targeting our conservation efforts to ensure the continued existence of blacktail prairie dogs on the grassland. But, you know, despite poisoning, you know, we don't have the huge poisoning campaigns. It is fairly localized and, and, and when I say localized, I mean, you can still talk about, you know, uh, hundreds of acres but it's fairly localized. Plague is there on the landscape, but you know we have seen that prairie dogs can uh, uh, survive some of these outbreaks. It takes some time for them to recur, you know, reoccupy the area, but they can. But the one single greatest threat that you know you talk to people is the encroachment of of, of woody vegetation onto the landscape. And we really need to get a handle of that. And so that would be my one uh, conservation action that I think that we could do that would allow not only prairie dogs, but other grassland species to increase. Taylor, same for you. A final thought. Uh, are you positive or negative uh, on the future for prairie dogs? And if there's one thing you could do uh, to make their lives easier. I look at how tough prairie dogs are and how they bounce back from so many threats and I feel positive about their future. I think that we can, uh, as, as two species, learn to live alongside each other better than we are now. So I definitely feel positive about it. I would say what I would like to see is greater education about and appreciation for grasslands as an ecosystem. They are one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world and one of the least conserved or protected or appreciated. Hmm. Um, the historical record, you read about what the grasslands of North America used to look like. They were the Serengeti of the Americas and they were thriving and teeming with life. And we just don't see that now. So people don't have a baseline for understanding what grasslands could look like. And I wish that more people knew what an incredible and vibrant landscape grasslands could be and are in a lot of places still, but only in small, small, much smaller remnants than they used to be. So I would love for more people to learn what grasslands provide us. They provide us ecosystem services of all kinds, including a lot of carbon sequestration. Um, but not only that, they're incredibly vibrant, beautiful um, communities of really fascinating life and a lot of people just don't know that and don't um and thus don't have motivation to conserve them so i would love to see that change yeah i was i was a bit surprised when i heard about uh, grasslands being even more effective uh, apparently than like the arboreal forests in, in terms of carbon sequestration i know there's a, a movement in russia to bring back the mammoths and have uh, them trample down the tundra for that very purpose. But anyway, I want to thank both uh, Bill and Taylor for their time. I'll link to both of your organizations below this video uh, for anyone who's interested. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.